Historians of Reddit, what is the biggest fluff you moment in history? A pirate known as Jean Lafitte had a bounty of $500 put on him by a governor. So he put a $5,000 bounty on the governor. Napoleon invited his brother-in-law to speak with him before his coronation as emperor to remind the brother-in-law that he objected to Napoleon marrying Josephine because Napoleon would amount to nothing. When Otto von Bismarck was about 50, he was walking down a street when a man ran up to him and shot him five times. Otto then turned around and began to beat the absolute garbage out of him until some armed guards come to help him. When they inspected Otto for wounds, they found that all five hit, but they all either just grazed him or bounced off his ribs. Literally the Iron Chancellor. So when France exiles Napoleon Bonaparte the first time, they didn't think to change out military personnel. So he basically rolls up to the first French outpost he gets to, says, sup, and begins reassembling an army. By the time he gets to Paris, he's got enough forces that France is like, well, welcome back. Quote. In Ad 37 the new Roman Emperor Gaius, better known by the nickname Caligula, built a bridge across the sea. It stretched three miles across the deep blue waters of the Bay of Naples at ancient Rome's most fashionable seaside resort of Baiae. But Caligula's was no ordinary bridge. It was a temporary, floating structure built on wooden pontoons, a costly and impressive feat of engineering. It served a single purpose before being dismantled. On a day of boiling heat watched by crowds of spectators, Caligula rode across the bridge. His armor glinted in the sunlight, for the 24-year-old emperor had dressed himself in the golden breastplate of the legendary Greek hero Alexander the Great. On the following day Caligula made the journey in reverse, this time riding in a chariot, followed by soldiers of his personal guard. It was a pointless piece of showmanship, lost on the majority of the crowd, several of whom fell drunkenly to their deaths in the sea after two days partying. One historian claimed Caligula pulled the stunt to disprove a prophecy that he had no more chance of becoming emperor than of riding a horse across the Bay of Baiae. In the 1970s the small town of Vulcan, West Virginia asked for state funding to replace a bridge into town. The state legislature refused to grant Vulcan the funding they needed. Instead the town appealed to the Soviet Union for aid. After hearing about the request, the state legislature immediately granted over $1 million for the town to build a new bridge. If a small town in WV asking for Soviet funding in the middle of the Cold War isn't a big middle finger to the state government, then I don't know what is. British prisoner of war in Nazi Germany stitches a quilt. The Nazis put it out for show. Hidden in Morse code stitched in were the words, Fluff Hitler, and, God save the Queen, God save the King. I think I just had the Queen song stuck in my head. I would say the moment that Rollo swore allegiance to the French king, the bishop's presence suggested that Rollo kiss the king's foot, as a sign of submission. It was probably an idea intended to humiliate Rollo, and was not taken very well. After some discussion, it was agreed that one of Rollo's men would do it. However, the person chosen lifted the king's foot, and, without bending down, brought it up to his mouth. Not surprisingly the king fell over, amid general laughter in the court. Following this amusing scene, the king and his men swore to honor the concession to Rollo. Quote opening square bracket. This requires some background. The Spartans were famously blunt. They were trained to get to the point when speaking instead of using artsy and beautiful language that would have been common at the time by being bitten on the thumb if they became long-winded. Now to the meat. Philip II of Macedon, Alexander the Great's father, sent the Spartans a letter saying, Would you like me to enter your land as friend or foe? The Spartans responded with one word. Neither. Philip was irate. He then sent another long-winded message. If once I enter into your territories, I will destroy ye all, never to rise again. The Spartans then sent back one word. If. It was like putting your head in a lion's mouth and I love it. Edit, I was typing in a car. Excuse the typos. On the crowning of King Henry V, he backdated his own reign to before the date of the Battle of Bosworth, meaning anyone who was loyal to him now but had shown any sign of opposition at Bosworth was now a traitor and an enemy to the realm. Justice served. This is already one of my favorite at threads in Reddit history. Galvarino, Chilean warrior who had both his hands cut off by the conquistadors for raising arms against the Spanish. Instead of letting himself serve as a message of helplessness in the face of the invaders the crazy brother strapped swords to his stumps and went on the warpath. 
After the restoration, the English dug up the body of Oliver Cromwell and hung, drawn and quartered the body, sticking the head on London Bridge. This is more petty, but when Taft bragged to his friends via telegram about scaling a mountain on horseback, that it was a few thousand feet, clear weather, all in all not too difficult, his friend replied, how is horse? When Germanic tribes invaded Britain after the Romans left, they named the native Celts Welisk, meaning foreigner even though they themselves were the foreigners. That later became the word Welsh, which the English promptly adopted for phrases like Welch on a bet. But TLDR, all of history has been one giant etymological middle finger to the Welsh. My personal favorite it, the beginning of the Battle of Stamford Bridge, in England, 1066. England's been invaded by a Norwegian army led by Harald Hardrada, King of Norway, and Tostig Godwinson, exiled English Earl and estranged brother to the English King. They've already fought one battle, they've captured York. Things are looking good for them. They're chilling, enjoying their success, waiting at Stamford Bridge for the hostages they demanded. And it's a hot day. They're not expecting any trouble. But wait an English army shows up. That's practically impossible. The Battle of Fulford Gate had taken place only five days ago, and the Norwegians had completely routed the forces of the Northern Earls. The rest of the English army was known to be in the south, awaiting a Norman invasion. Turns out the English had ridden all the way up north in four days. The Norwegians were, understandably, a bit unhappy. They form into a circle. They don't have their armor with them it's at the ships. It's too hot to be hanging around in mail. They've got helmets and shields and weaponry, and that's it. The English send a rider to negotiate. He tells Tostig that his brother the king is willing to offer him his earldom back and part of the rule of England if he gives up now. Tostig asks what his buddy Harold Hardrada gets for his trouble. Six feet of English ground, or as much more as he needs, being taller than other men. Tostig says they're done here. The rider rides away. Harold Hardrada asks who that dude was, because if it had been him talking, he'd have just killed the brother there. Tostig says oh, that's my brother. That's Harold Godwinson, the king. Harold Godwinson rode up to an enemy army personally and told the king of Norway, known to be a great warrior and general, that all he'd get from this invasion was a grave. Battle commences. Norwegians lose. Tostig and Harold Hardrada both die. Huge bloody mess. English army is crippled. And then three days later the Normans land in the south. Harold is fluffed. He still marches his army back, gathers as much force as he can, and engages three weeks later. Late, he's killed at Hastings. Normans conquer England. Basically a very personal fluff you moment that snowballed quite intensely. Edit, because a lot of people are asking yes, this was the battle with the legendary berserker at the bridge. No, it probably didn't actually happen. The story appears hundreds of years later and is very inconsistent. Also, there might not have been an actual bridge there at the time. The first cell phone. The first call ever made from a cell phone was to a competitor's landline. Big Slong Energy. The reply of the Zaporozhian Cossacks is the best response to a demand for surrender, ever. In response to requests by the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire to desist attacks and submit Zaporozhian Cossacks to the Turkish Sultan, O Sultan, Turkish Devil and Darn Devil's Kith and Kin, Secretary to Lucifer himself. What the devil kind of knight are thou, that canst not slay a hedgehog with your naked ass? The devil garbages, and your army eats. Thou shalt not, thou son of a whore, make subjects of Christian sons, we have no fear of your army, by land and by sea we will battle with thee, fluff thy mother. Thou Babylonian scullion, Macedonian wheelwright, brewer of Jerusalem, goat fluffer of Alexandria, swineherd of greater and lesser Egypt, pig of Armenia, Podolian thief, catamite of Tartary, hangman of Camayanes, and fool of all the world and underworld, an idiot before God, grandson of the serpent, and the crick in our slong. Pig's snout, mare's ass, slaughterhouse cur, unchristened brow, screw thine own mother, so the Zaporozhians declare, you lowlife. You won't even be hurting pigs for the Christians. Now we'll conclude, for we don't know the date and don't own a calendar, the moon's in the sky, the year with the Lord, the day's the same over here as it is over there, for this kiss our ass, Koshovi Otaman Ivan Serko, with the whole Zaporozhian host. Edit, seven years in and my first gold. Neat. More weight. This was played in besieged Leningrad. And it was broadcasted on radio, so Nazi soldiers could hear it. Imagine hearing, fluff you, from a city that you thought was already dead.
not the biggest, probably, but the first that came to mind, Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe's response to the Nazi demand that Bastogne surrender, nuts. Of Kiev. When her husband died, the country that killed him assumed they'd just take over and force her into marriage. She straight up killed the dignitaries that were sent to tell her she had to marry, multiple times, in the most intense way possible. She then traveled to where her husband had been killed and basically burnt the place to the ground, again, in the most hardcore, amazing way. They made her a freaking saint. Worth the read on Wikipedia.